And welcome to somehow it, I'm blurry. What is it focused on? There it goes. It's pulling all kinds of things. It's got a cup. Oh, uh, well, yeah. Let's just focus on the cup right there. Ta da. Limited edition cups that don't exist for anybody except for me. Put and that people in your that pipe are really special. It. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Uh, welcome to Bird Dog Chat with Ethan and Cat. We are here live this evening in Texas. Kansas. Negative. Something something is moving. Was something moving? Charles fixed stuff. <laughs> <laughs> He's fixing it. I like it. <sighs> we are here. You are here. So we are live from Kansas, Bird Dog Chat with Ethan and Kat. And tonight's topic of discussion is going to be kids and dogs. And the struggle is real, folks. And we're going to be talking about how to work through some of the chaos. We also want to do our check-ins, which we're going to get to very quickly here. But to give everyone that may be new to our show a kind of rundown of the order of events. So we're going to do our check-ins. It's nice to see where people are tuning in from. I'm going to talk about some upcoming events and some past little events and then roll into our topic and then get into questions. Uh, so if you have a question that you're just burning a hole in your pocket, throw it up with a super chat and we'll get to it and give it priority. But otherwise, we'll be rolling into those in kind of the second half of the show tonight. Want me to start with questions or check-ins? Yeah, before you do that, though, I just want to say thank you to patrons. Uh, we have a Patreon community set up, and lots of different people have different communities set up within this kind of niche. It's a really easy way for people to support. It's one of those things that we do get asked fairly regularly, and they say thanks for everything you do, which there's something we could do. Um, that's what this is set up for. We took a little additional spin to that by... Basically setting it up as a you ask, we answer type of private group with a subscription. You do pay for it, but gives you the ability to ask all the questions you want without feeling bad, included but not limited to um, live video chats where I actually sit, watch your session with you, or just have a, a consult kind of on where you're at, where you need to go from there. So um, patrons are the largest supporter of everything that we do standing stone here online. And just want to say thank you to anyone that is a patron. Absolutely. And if you guys are patrons, you should be getting your bingo cards. Did you mention that? No. So Charles had that pulled up bingo Baker. So if you guys are unsure, what is that all about? Um, if you're a patron, you can get a bingo card and play bird dog chat bingo with us as we go. Any of our idiosyncrasies and things that we talk about on a regular, Miss Kelly has put into a bird dog bingo chat card producer thing, thingy dingy. Um, and Miss Kelly's actually a patron. And so she was like, I want to do this for you guys because it would be awesome. So then you get your card and you play along throughout the evening. And then at the midway point, end of the night, whenever it happens, if you get a bingo, you type in bingo. And then we're going to give something really awesome away tonight because tonight is a kids and dogs topic. We're giving away one of our kids, guys. Your choice. Aiden or Cade. Just messing with ya, um, kind of. <laughs> but we will, I don't even know if we actually have a real prize because we are so uh, stuck on giving away one of the kids tonight that we thought that would be a really funny thing to say. Let's go shopping. Let's go shopping. Hey, yeah, throw in what you guys want. Go into the online store, standingstonesupply.com. What are we going to do? Home, I don't know. Hunting, Let's talk about training. home. Home. We're talking about home, kids and dogs. Let's click on that. I dig it. I'd click that. Oh, we got treats and chew bones, caranda beds, 
Did you know Coranda is going to be discontinuing the slip covers, guys? So what we got is what we got. When it's gone, it's gone. And then we'll have to come up with something else. Mm. We'll still have the Coranda beds themselves, but not the slip covers. And we got lots of nail trimmers and Dremels and food bins and grooming gloves. So cool items in there. What do you want to give away, babe? I don't know. I thought people were going to message what they wanted us to give away. No, nobody's kidding. nobody said anything. So no, that's all right. Throw the, some options um, up there, and we'll decide. Just the yeah, something on there. Yeah. I don't know, dog beds are pretty cool. Yeah. So if you guys were watching that first um, thirty second video intro when you tuned in tonight, all of our dogs are on dog beds. 50% of those dog beds are Coranda beds, uh, the platform style, which is awesome. It really creates a distinct boundary between being on the bed, off the bed, which makes <clears throat> controlling the chaos in a household with multiple dogs and multiple kids a little easier. So, yeah, let's give away a dog bed tonight. I, I like, like it. it. I like it. Boom. Jinx, you owe me a, a soda. Pinch poke. Oh, give away some of Ethan's pigeons. <laughs> Deal. Hmm. <laughs> so let's go ahead and roll through some check-ins tonight and then we'll get into some other topics of discussion. So we, it looks like I was going to say we're, we're up a bunch of people. Why don't you play that little video clip again? Just to kind of set the mood for set the mood. I like it. Charles, tell me when you're ready and I'll hit play. It's you looking at me, you being ready. You still plugged in? Oh, no. <laughs> <coughs> We've you, had multiple technical you difficulties. You told me this it would evening. charge through this you little dingle yeah, dongle. It will. You have to plug your charger in on the <laughs> bottom of that, though. Ah. Well. Now plug your charger in. Oh, oh, I see. To the bottom of the Technology. dingle dongle. Technology. Hold on. Okay, good. Because my phone is about to die. Now it's plugged in and charging, like you said it would. And you can play. I just want to say one thing. There's um, there's literally no question when you walk in our home if we are, in fact, dog people. Yeah, the, the eating kitchen space right there that's supposed to be set up for a nice little breakfast nook with a table and chairs is our dog bed center. Slash timeout zone. <laughs> if you're a kid. Absolutely. Dog beds work great for place training your children and your dogs. Anyway, so um, dog beds, as you saw in that video clip there, highly valuable in controlling some of the chaos. So the Coranda bed is the giveaway for tonight. So get your bird dog bingo cards so that you can play along and get a chance at one of those Coranda dog beds. So let's go ahead and roll through check-ins. And we are starting from, hello from Cottonwood, California, Latrobe, <laughs> Pennsylvania. But currently at Universal Orlando, what? Sounds like a vacation. Central Missouri, let it rain. Man, we got some rain, but it was not enough this last couple 24 hours. Like the equivalent of uh, both boys peeing off the deck at the same time. <laughs> I literally, it was sprinkling while it was sunny out earlier. And I said, hey, Aiden, isn't it crazy? It's sprinkling and sunny. And he goes, I recognized that, Mom. I'm like, Really? These are words you say to your mother as a four-year-old? Apparently. Mm. Uh, we got Lone Oak, Texas, Minnesota, Melanie and Kendall, and the Poodle Pointers from Minnesota. Ooh, tick season. Yeah, it's tick season here, too. Angleton, Texas, Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, Pretty Prairie, whoop, whoop. I don't know. I think we need a running tally of how many weeks in a row that's been. Five? Five weeks? Woo, Annie. Southern California. Elijah, you guys have made it back to California already? You guys have made good time. Kathleen and Justin and Zeke in Georgia. Springfield, Illinois. Corpus Christi, Texas. Hey, Ashley, thanks for checking in tonight. And Robert, you should be headed our way pretty dang soon. Isn't it the this weekend that Taylor's coming back? Yeah, he'll be here Friday. Yeah. 
Rock and roll. I mean, I guess it doesn't take two days to get from Chicago, Illinois area, Springfield, Illinois. Area. It's going to take him two days to pack the bourbon. But otherwise. <laughs> okay. Uh, where are we? Salt St. Marie, I'm Ontario. Missing. Oh, and I miss Montpelier, Indiana. Parachute, Colorado. Oklahoma. Oregon. Washington State. Wiki Wachi, Florida. I love saying that. You guys have to check in every night because, or every Wednesday night because I just like saying that. Wiki Wachi. Cleveland, Ohio. Auburn, Alabama. Michigan. Nevada. Oh, we jumped. It, it bounced. Uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Pennsylvania. The not so steady pheasant is in the background. Yeah. Mm hmm. Quebec, Canada, another international check-in here. I'm thinking that we need to just do... Um, <gasps> North Carolina. I'm thinking for that rooster back Alabama, there. Alabama, Mission, need, Kansas. Hey, Ian. We need to add arms and then have him tipping a bottle back or something like that. Oh, well, we could do that. It's kind of depressing, though, because like the whole story behind that pheasant is not to be like silliness. It's an awesome story. It's... Trix's first pheasant. It's the first pheasant we we've ever had mounted, and it's like. Wah, wah, wah. What wah, if we took wah, like wah. little arms off of a baby doll and stuck them? No, to that's the what side. I'm saying. Like, it's not supposed to be humorous. It's supposed to be. Grab my good arm. <sighs> I'm moving along. California, Des Moines, Iowa, Ooh. Salado, Texas. Atlanta, Georgia, Damascus, Maryland. I like that recommendation. The bed or a grooming glove. We're going to go with an $85 <laughs> bed or an $8 grooming glove. <laughs> Great I, suggestion. They're awesome. If you win, I'm you're getting easy. the grooming glove. Just saying. <laughs> uh, Central That's Florida. That's horribly mean. <laughs> they wanted it. Okay. Well, maybe we'll just throw the grooming glove in. <laughs> Bonus. Central Florida, Manhattan, Kansas. You got back in two days. You were making time. Jeff Good City, night. Missouri. That's two hard days. Laguna Beach, <laughs> California. <laughs> T-Rex arms on the pheasant. Yeah. Uh, I'm saying. Uh, a toy guitar, too. Oh, man. You guys are not helping. Fun fact. Uh, T-Rex's arms, right? They are literally just made of cartilage. We need to fact check that because that's what our four and a half year old told us. I Aiden, believe everything that he says. He is Pretty dang good, but I I still think he we has should no fact reason check. to make it up. He doesn't even know what cartilage is. <laughs> <laughs> He's just repeating facts that we read out of a storybook to him. That well. could be. So, guys, I have to share something that was exciting that happened to me this weekend at our Lone Stone seminar. <laughs> boop, 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 boop. I got two bottles of gin because people were asking the week before Wait what kind of gin I like. N now and I gotta poke you just a little well, bit. What? Let me see that bottle of uh, gin you got this weekend. <laughs> Let's just say it was good, folks. Let's yeah. just say it was good. Yeah, that yeah. did work. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> it was good. Yeah, Thank you, Miss Kelly. And Angelo, I got the other bottle, and I haven't cracked that yet, so it's full. So maybe tonight. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Would you share any of that with me? I would gladly share any of my bourbon with you. Hmm. I'll get back to you on that one. Okay. So any other little things that you want to talk about other than when we roll into our kid and dog topic? I, I like that. We should get a top hat for the pheasant. Mm -hmm. We're going to decorate this little turd. Ah, I wonder if I could get, remember that guy that danced around in his basement and made hats? I wonder if I could get him to make me a micro top hat. This, I bet it'd be easier to just buy one on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Tiny top hat. Okay. Anything else you want to? Throw out there? No. Okay. I think that's good. So kids and dogs. So this has always been a conversation, conversational topic. Uh, we get asked all the time, how do you manage dogs and kids, kids and dogs? And I'll tell you, before we had our own kids, it was so much easier to be like, oh, yeah, you just 
do this. You just do that. You don't know what you don't know until you've experienced it. You really have no true understanding of what managing kids and dogs, especially multiple kids and multiple dogs, can actually look like. 1,000%. So I want to just take this moment um, to apologize <laughs> to everyone that I said, you just have to tell the kids to stop playing with the dogs. Just leave whatever. them alone. Because that's pretty much what we say on repeat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, they love the dogs, and they love to play with the dogs. And we try and advocate for the kids and the dogs. So when the dogs are getting rowdy and excited and want to play too rough with the kids, we're like, hey, 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 that's too much. Knock it off. But when the dog or the kids are trying to play too rough with the dogs. And even if the dogs don't seem to mind it, it's still one of those things that I want to advocate for our dogs because I don't want it to turn or escalate or for the dogs to be like, this kind of isn't enjoyable um, and think that they need to try and tell the kids that enough is enough or something like that, which honestly, I don't see any of our dogs doing. The most that I would see is them avoiding the situation where they're like, I've had enough of these kids crawling on me, messing with me, pestering me. I'm just going to avoid. I'm going to leave the dog bed. I'm going to leave the area and go to the couch and then avoid and go to the chair and just kind of avoid the situation. And that is also not something that I want to uh, allow the kids to harass the dogs and push them around um, by making them want to avoid the situation. So advocating for both is huge. But let's get back to um, why dogs and kids are a little bit chaotic. It really comes down to energy, I think, and probably oh, mental <laughs> um, mental fortitude. They fall in the same realm of, especially with younger dogs, they fall in the same realm of wanting to play. They're just, just they're all babies and children, right? So they want to play. Attention spans are short and as you are attempting to say, do this, I mean, it wears off moments later. It's squirrel. Yeah. And that's the same thing with the kids themselves. I mean, you can literally say, don't drive your car on the dog anymore because it's not polite. I mean, disrespectful really. to the dog. Yeah. So it comes into the advocating for both category, but don't drive your truck on the dog. And then you look over. And maybe this is just our situation, but we have more than one dog. So then he's driving his truck on the next dog and then the next dog. And then dog, laying and then on the next dog. The and next you're like, dog. stop laying on the dogs. And then you look around and they're laying on the other dog. So it's a constant state of reminding, whether that's reminding the dogs to stay on their dog beds and not, you know, get crazy in the house and steal kids toys and be rambunctious, as well as reminding the kids, hey, don't try and encourage the dogs to break off their dog beds, don't chase them around, don't crawl on them, don't drive trucks on them, all of the things. Um, and I would definitely say that you hit a point where things get easier, um, and that point happens so much faster with dogs <laughs> than it does with kids, um, because... Mm -hmm. We have Glitch, who is six months old, and he is doing a phenomenal job staying on his dog bed um, through crazy amounts of distractions. And um, then we have Cade, who's almost two, and Aiden, who's four and a half, that we're finally getting there with them, um, you know, and definitely the energy level feeds off of each other. So one kid versus two kids, exponentially more chaos. One dog versus six dogs, exponentially more chaos and more management and um, unpredictableness and the loss of control at times. <laughs> I'll share. I love that you had to type it on the thing. Uh, that looks like a giant cub. Is I there a... <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I would say the, the biggest thing all the way around with the whole process is that if you are fighting the good fight of children and dogs... 
You just need to understand that it is a process and there is no magical fix for it. Um, I think today is a day of, I don't want to say humbling because that's not the case, but let's go just like bringing things full circle into helping people to see that we are the same. We are, and sometimes all it takes is like the affirmation aspect of things, knowing that it is okay. And we do this on, you know, I do this on Patreon with conversations with people that are just like, is this right? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. What you're doing is fine. I mean, that is important to be able to see. Um, we shot a video today and it was with Hex. Like we sat down and like, ooh, we're going to do this. It's going to be cool. At the Lone Stone seminar this weekend, it's always like, I want to incorporate more of these marking drills and things into the dogs. And I'm like, Hex likes to play fetch. He, he was really good at it, loves to play fetch. Let's just do this little drill with him and encourage that. Well, it was a total disaster of a video, which is, um, I say disaster of a video because nothing really went right. And he struggled a bunch, which makes it a really good video to show that we also have sessions like that. They don't happen all the time, but we do have sessions like that. And for me, it was tough because it's mentally difficult start talking, you're explaining, okay, we're going to do this. And it's like throw a bumper for him and he runs over and, and decides that he needs to now poop behind the ranger. You know, it's like, okay, so we got that out of our system. Now let's try and move into the session. Um, but, and there was a time that we moved back and uh, Dustin looks at me and goes, do you, do you want to keep going with this? Cause this is kind of turning into a disaster. I'm like, yeah, let's just keep rolling with it because it is what the session is. It's and real life. And that's the thing that we always try and show, whether that's from a training session standpoint to just real life with the kids and the dogs and what that actually is like. It's because it's relatable. We've been there, done that. When people are like, hey, I don't know what I should be doing. Can I get my dog to point a dead bird in the field or point a bumper with wings on it? And instead of being like, uh, that's a stupid question, be like, no, been there, done that, made the same mistakes before we knew. You don't know what you don't know. Just like with the kids, you don't know how chaotic kids and dogs can truly be until you've lived that life. And we want to be the first ones to say, we've been there, we've done that, and we can offer realistic advice. Um, and I think that that is truly what all of the advice, tips, tricks, and things, and training um, videos that we put out there really have in common is the authenticity of this is real, and this is what it's like for us. It's what it's like for a lot of people, and it doesn't always go perfectly, and there is struggles, and we um, know that you're probably struggling with it at home if we are too, so. For sure. So I think the biggest thing as far as kids and dogs together and kind of bringing this shorter topic this evening to, you know, essentially where, where it is, is understand that it is difficult. And the biggest things that you need to be doing is advocating for both and then incorporating everybody in the family into training and into the life of the dogs. And the more that you do that, the more that the kids start to understand expectations and rules and um, the dogs understand how to listen to them. For example, we have um, Aiden has been begging for probably over a year to be able to sleep with a dog. And he's finally got that opportunity, sleeping with one of the older retired females, Allie. And she's super sweet, but... It took a little while for him to be able to show, prove that he would be respectful, even if we weren't around. And, he and would responsible. Be fair and yep. responsible and be fair to Allie. And um, not that anything that the kids are really doing is 100% unfair. It's just one of those that making sure that he understands what expectations are. And now she sleeps with him in his bedroom most night, almost every night. And when he gets up in the morning, he brings her downstairs and lets her out to go potty and then brings her back inside. So all really big things, and I would say probably pretty big things for a four-year-old. But because he's had the opportunity to want to do these things and learn. This is how we do it for the rest of the dogs. 
it's taken allowing him to help in those at all of the times that we do let outs and the times that we do training sessions and incorporating them in a sense of let's feed the dogs and help them to understand they need to respect the children and not jump on them, knock the food bowls out. And in that learning process, that's probably only happened, ooh, I don't know, a bunch of times and you've got an entire bowl of dog food spilled all over the place. So, either. This one. We haven't opened that one yet, Charles. Oh. Mm-hmm. I want to be the first to taste it. Okay. That's that's what she said. Is that what you were saying? <laughs> uh, so, so I'm going to play this real quick. The, oh, okay. Because it's adorable, and I love every minute of it. Oh, I can't hear it. We can't. Oh, maybe I can't either. Oh, we can't hear it. Sorry. Unless you have it on your phone. Uh, I probably do. <coughs> I don't have it with the captions, obviously, but um, why not? Well, I don't just think go to Instagram. But that's what Charles is playing it yeah, off. Yeah, of. but on your phone, it will work on your phone if you go to your Instagram. Oh, it will. So okay, okay, yep, yep. got it. And I'm still plugged into the thingy dingy. Okay, mm-hmm. so tell me when you're ready. Oh, hold on. One, two, three, go. It's oh, audio huh. off. <laughs> There's a button for that. <laughs> that is on Earth. <laughs> what are you doing on Earth, Allie? What are you doing on Earth, Allie? She's snuggling you. Yeah. <laughs> So Aiden has, um, what on earth are you doing is a little twisted around to be, what is Allie doing on earth? (laughs) Well, close enough. Um, but yes, he gets to sleep with her now and we definitely incorporated him into training sessions, learning responsibility, and even Cade helps feed the dogs. He wants to help feed the dogs during training sessions. Uh, he doesn't get to be in charge of the clicker because his timing would be terrible. Um, and he would click that clicker all the time. But keeping the kids involved, teaching them how to reward the dogs for behaviors, how to expect them to stay in their kennels or on their dog beds while they're being fed is really important. And then respecting the dogs while they're eating and not messing with them the entire time. Um, Those are all things that we instill in our kids, teach them, um, and have them be a part of. So we really recommend that being part of your day-to-day activities if you have kids and dogs, as well as just realistic expectations. That's the thing that I can't stress enough, not only with kids and dogs, but with uh, in all aspects of dog training and raising puppies and things like that. You cannot have unrealistic expectations and be successful. So We've got a four-year-old, four-and-a-half-year-old, if you will, and a two-year-old and multiple dogs and young puppies that are, you know, six months old or younger. I can't expect things to be smooth and perfect and not a little bit of chaos. And so controlling the chaos in different fashions. So whether you say, okay, this right now is teaching bad behaviors for the kids, for the dogs, for everything. What is the fairest thing to do? Instead of trying to holler at kids, holler at the dogs and get frustrated, it would be best to say, okay. Take this out on my husband. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) It would be best to take it out on your husband and yell at him. No, uh, to say, okay, this isn't working. This is too much chaos. There's too much energy. And let's go ahead and put puppy up in their crate. Crate time is completely fine if the puppy is getting plenty of quality out time other times. So, hey, we are going to put puppy up while we're getting ready for dinner because there's just too much chaos. And then after dinner, as a family, we can go outside. We can burn off some of that energy in an appropriate way. But definitely being fair to the puppies as well as the kids because, you know, they get excited. They want to play with a puppy. But if all I'm doing is constantly saying, stop doing that, stop chasing the dog, you know, that's not an enjoyable opportunity for them to play with the puppy either. So um, putting them in the right situation and setting them up for success is really important and having those realistic expectations during that playtime and interactions. I like it. So um, if you have puppies and kids, 
or multiple dogs and multiple kids, and you're struggling with things, reach out to us. We've got tips. We've got tricks. Now that we've got kids of our own, we really do have tips and tricks um, and would be happy to share some of that with you. Do you want to jump into some questions for the evening? Absolutely. Let's see here. This says, hi, my name is Zach Stump. Stump. I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah, sounds about right. And I have two dogs. One is a full-blooded cur, and one is a full-blooded running walker. And I am trying to exercise them for lion and bear, and I have no idea how to do it. Well, Zach, I am sorry in this situation. I cannot help you. We can definitely give suggestions as far as, like, conditioning dogs um, to get them in good cardiovascular health and that maybe is what you're asking for uh where you know they're just in good shape in the off season you know we're running into warmer weather here for sure and charles has it pulled up we do a lot of roading the dogs and running them off of four wheelers early in the morning when things are still cool not only does that condition them for you know their cardiovascular health keeping them in good body shape as well as conditioning those pads. And I would imagine, this is an assumption, but lion and bear terrain is probably pretty rough country. So having your dog's pads in really good condition so that they don't roll into the season for that and blow pads and be limping and lame because they haven't properly conditioned for that. I suppose if the question was just in regards to exercising them, that's a really good answer. And that's kind of what it says. I read it as how to teach how to them train to them to do that. <laughs> Lion and bear dogs. Oh my! I <laughs> I suck. All right, let's I go. I would to say the next carefully. One. Yeah, very carefully. Very, very carefully. Mm-hmm. Ooh, this is a good one. Taylor, hello. I've got a three-month-old GSP who is very aggressive with tug while fetching. It gets to the point where he can barely get the toy away. Really have to pry his mouth open hard. Any tips? So. If you've got a puppy that has really got a good, tight, firm grip um, and is overly amped with the tug game, that is an opportunity to say, hey, we're probably playing too excitedly. You've got to gauge your puppy's reaction. If you've got a lower drive puppy, you might have to amp them up a bit and, you know, puppy party it up and get really, really excited with that tug game to get them to hold on to it that nicely. If you've got a puppy that's a little over the top already, you need to kind of take it down a notch and control that training session, control that tug and keep it, keep it engaging, but not overly exciting to the point where they are unable to, you know, kind of think through that or just getting too carried away. Um, we try and play a little bit of tug. And when that puppy shows a nice firm hold and they're excited and they're engaged and they're bringing that bumper back, um, we try and then praise them calmly. That's really important too, to, in- to show them that, Hey, what you're doing is good. And they're already an excitable breed. <laughs> Short hairs are. So let's then calmly tell them, good. Calmly pet them. Good. Let them hold on to that for a little bit longer at your side. Kind of condition those behaviors of like swinging into a heel position, standing at your side, being calm while you're petting them. And then yes, taking the bumper. And you might have to pry their mouth open a little bit, pick up on their flank a little bit to get that bumper out of their mouth. But I would much rather have a dog that's got a nice firm hold like that than the one that's barely holding on to it or spitting the bumper. If you need more help, we are absolutely available on Patreon to help work through those sessions with you. Did you find another question? Yeah, it's, uh, I saw that Yeti while you were up there and it looked for it on your own store. Uh, yeah, we don't have the Sorry. Yeti stuff on our store, Sorry. that Yeti dog bed. But no, I no, 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 the cup, the cup. Oh, I thought cup, you meant the on the, the story. Cup. There's a Yeti dog bed on the, or not story, but the little video clip at the beginning with, the dogs on the dog beds. There were more questions here. These are good questions so far. Oh. I'll go ahead and click buy it now. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yep. Why are we, oh, the arms. Yes. Got it. The arms. And I saw I can buy little top hats, but I can get a, a, a hundred pack. I don't think we need a hundred. Trix has a lot of work to do. If you're going to get a hundred. Yeah, she got to point a lot more pheasants to get mounted. It'd be a very expensive 
pheasantry cluster. I think at that point we could probably roosters. just throw the 99 other top hats away before we pay for uh, another 99 uh, pheasant taxidermies. I guess. Puppy pictures. Oh, yeah. Little itty bitty puppies with top hats on. That's oh, yeah. kind of cute. Hmm. Probably be easier to Photoshop top hats than keep top hats on their head. Uh, so here's a question from Leland Weta King. I might have mispronounced that. I mm. apologize. I know that this is not a part of the topic tonight, but how do I fix using a vibrator collar from discipline to correction because he is scared of it? Mm. Let's go ahead. It's a big topic, okay? So first and foremost, I would say we see it fairly regularly, but... Um, Vibrate can be more aversive than stimulation. And Vibrate, we use a lot. We have dogs that are pretty bold, confident, mentally stable. All of those things are important. But when we look at dogs that do struggle with Vibrate the first time you use it, it doesn't mean that they're broken forever. I would just say probably look into utilizing low levels of stimulation. And this depends on which type of collar you have. Um, DT collars are really good in the sense that they have uh, they have pretty small increments on the lower step on the lower settings and it kind of scales up as you go. So you do have a lot of, um, a lot of level changes in the bottom end of the collar. Now, all of that being said, I would go with switching to the low level of stimulation. I would put a continuous on a one or whatever your bottom end is. And that's going to be, I mean, it's going to be really, really important in being able to kind of fine tune the understanding. I know that stimulation probably gets a worse name, but ultimately with a lot of dogs, especially dogs struggle with vibrate, stimulation is going to work better. Um, one thing that you can do, this is, uh, we talked about the, uh, I don't think on a live, I talked about it this last weekend, but you can go up one or two clicks at a time to find a level that you see like a small amount of acknowledgement basically from the dog. They kind of twitch or they kind of look like, what, what is that? And then that's the level that I would say at for the beginning stages of conditioning. Later, we will use higher levels to essentially proof the collar conditioning. Uh, much that we would uh, after utilizing and building a good foundation with Vibrate. But if Vibrate doesn't work, don't continue to beat the dead proverbial horse, but um, try and switch to stimulation, and I bet that that makes a big difference. So it's not abnormal. Again, I probably see more people that struggle with collar conditioning in regards to vibrate now than we do dogs that did fine, do, do fine with vibrate. Would you say older dogs have a bigger problem with it than puppies? I mean, I think that's what on it feels average, like, but that's pretty anecdotal from my point. But yeah, I think most of the dogs that I see that have issues with vibrate are a smidgen older than when we start collar conditioning. So, like, we're probably in the vicinity of 16 weeks we start vibrate conditioning dogs. And in that, like, with our dogs, not a whole lot phases them in that category um, at all. But dogs that or maybe six or eight months, haven't started any collar conditioning at all, and Vibrate could be a smidge overwhelming. You know, I mean, it is what it is. Utilize stimulation, you will be fine. You're welcome. Nice. Okay, let's go to another question. Uh. From Dela Snyder, what would you say the safety difference is between a metal metal multi-dog dog box for a truck versus individual kennels? That's really interesting. We had this conversation the other day, kind of like a micro conversation in regards to it. It's like you were listening in or something. Creepy. Uh, yeah. So I say the other day, this was like three months ago, but <laughs> still. I'm pretty sure I was there and it was like three days ago. It's come up a few times in the past couple Times. Are you talking about at El Tesoro when we talked about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I was talking about when we were talking about it with Dustin. Yeah, that was today. 
Okay, so three days ago today. But we had a pretty long conversation at El Toro with a, a couple guys about Okay. Well, let's talk safety. about it now. So there's a couple of different things. I would say, first and foremost, if you want the heaviest duty unit that could probably accept rollovers in and of itself or what have you, as well as look sexy and professional and have additional add-ons like the setup that I've got right now. I've got a three-hole in the back of my truck. It's got rubber mats and fans and lights and a box underneath that you can put luggage and equipment, and that has lights and um, all of the things. That box is sweet. It's made by Ainley. Ainley makes the best dog boxes as far as fit, finish, hold up, um, durability. Let's go with that word instead of hold up ability. Uh, durability. And I think the trailer, the six hole, is a 1992. I don't think it's that old. Maybe it's I, I thought it was an it old looks like It could be. It's a 2002. A it's 20 years old. I think it's it's close to, if not all of, 20 years old. And uh, maybe it's 2006. Oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> it's, a, it's a 2002. <laughs> this is uh, the... Insurance uh, paperwork. Not, not insurance, but a county appraiser. Appraiser. So, um, anyhow, so it's a 2002, paperwork. so it's 21 years old. I took that when we bought it into Ainley. We're sidetracking for your question just a little bit, but I took it into Ainley. They helped put some gas shocks on and replaced a couple of the locks that, I don't know, keys had broken off in or something over the years. And basically, the rest of the trailer looks new. pretty much new. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't look 20 years old. So, uh, all of that being said, quality equipment. So, I have a three-hole in the back of the truck. It's awesome. We use and have looked at gunner kennels. They're awesome. I mean, they're durable. They've got double wall insulation. You can shoot them with a shotgun with seven and a half shot at 30 yards, and it doesn't go all the way through both sides. That's what all their videos show anyway. Both I haven't sides. attempted this. Let's not. No, especially <laughs> not with a dog in there. Jeez Louise. Well, they put a uh, like a like one of those cameras on the dog when they did it, and the dog was fine. <laughs> I'm <laughs> totally joking. <laughs> totally joking. The um, But then we, we also utilize Rothland kennels a lot at the kennel. Uh, we use them inside, and when we talked about it, you brought something up that I hadn't really thought of and didn't even, you know, didn't even really know, um, first of all, but didn't think of in the sense of how the kennels can absorb stuff that happens to dogs. Go ahead and, and break this down. You've got more information than yeah, me. Yeah, they're basically part of the per- – one of the people that designed the Rufflin kennels uh, worked in NASCAR in helmet design. So it's the kennel is specifically designed to give. So uh, if you see some videos online of like them dropping a weight on it and it crumples a little bit and the door cracks, the door is supposed to crack. It's why it's composite so that it can crack and still maintain with the four hooks and the four pins. If a corner breaks in a rollover or something, it's supposed to still stay on in the area so the dog doesn't get out. But it's still supposed to break so that the kennel can absorb some of the impact. So the example that was best given to me was in the 1970s when two giant Chevy cars ran into each other and didn't do any damage. And everybody went, ha ha, I can't feel my neck anymore. Um, you know, that was kind of like what the metal can, you know, the, the metal boxes, the gunners, that kind of stuff. Like they're just going to take it rigid. all. But yeah. now you take a two brand new cars and you bump each other in the parking lot and you need a new fender bumper because it all is designed to, to absorb some of that and absorb the energy. The other big thing that I think a lot of people miss is that most injuries and most accidents aren't rollovers. Most accidents are rear end or you're either rear ended or you rear end somebody and dogs that are sitting parallel, like the same direction as of travel get spinal injuries from that. So the, actually the safest way to haul a dog, in my opinion, is sideways in a Rufflin kennel. Um, so most common... Inside in, the vehicle. Yeah, or or secured under your bed rail, so lower than your bed rail. 
Um, cause most injuries occur with dogs and accidents are spinal or neck and it's due to compression from uh, front, front end collisions back. or rear end collisions. Yep. So even riding, I mean, you're going to talk about not absorbing anything, but the dogs riding in the trailer versus the dogs in yeah, the back better. of the truck is yep. better yep. from that standpoint. So if you think about if the trailer got rear ended or if the dogs are all sideways or if we rear ended somebody that sudden stop, they're already sideways. So their whole body is going to take the brunt of that instead of just their head or their Spine tail. compression. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, I definitely think that a key factor that you mentioned um, and should be mentioned is whatever you're utilizing, it should be securely attached to your vehicle because you don't want that crate flying around. Whether it's inside the vehicle, it becomes a very dangerous projectile mm -hmm. that can hit you, your other passengers, um, or in the back of the vehicle, it can be ejected from the back. So whatever you're utilizing, and even the three-hole dog box that you're using, it's properly mounted to the, the bed of the truck. So you definitely need to be using um, proper tie-downs and things like that to keep that do dog box, dog crates, whatever, secure in your vehicle. I pulled up on an accident in South Dakota, and there was two broken ferry kennels on the interstate. A, si a rollover. That would not be yeah. my mm. kennel so, of choice. No ferry kennels. One-piece design. So Lucky Ducks... Uh, gunners, Rufflins, one piece design. I mean, that's the a minimum, I would say, yeah. for safety. Well, gunners aren't a one piece design, well, but they are I should basically say strongly are, attached. They might as well be yeah. as, as the way that they're built. They're yeah. How they fit together. They basically turn one piece right, once they're right. assembled. Um, so great question. Uh, there was a question. I don't know where we were. I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah, we're so we just did that one. Um, how to increase toy drive? My poodle has motivation to train with food rewards. Hmm. So I would Take say it away, cat. <laughs> so I would say the number one way to increase toy drive and even retrieving drive a lot of times is to take the toys away, uh, because dogs have so much free time and then they're entertaining themselves, playing with whatever they want choosing the toys that they want. So then when it comes time to train and work, well, they've had access to toys all day, every day, and it's not as exciting. It's not as enjoyable. And so we need to make those toys, those retrieves more valuable. So giving them access to those toys less often uh, so that when it's training time means they're ready to train, ready to play, ready to work. Uh, so that would be my number one thing. And then also I think that retrieves and using toys as rewards and things like that gets overdone because it's easy to do play retrieves in your backyard or go to the dog park and play retrieves. But you need to keep those sessions short. You need to keep those reps, sm like smaller number of reps so that you don't overdo it. So that the excitement is still there. You want to quit before the dog wants to quit and you find that number and you stick to it and then you can push them and challenge them a little bit at a time. And if you ever push them past the point where they're like, eh, over it, you went too far and you need to backtrack a little bit. It's good. I'm glad you took that one. You, I couldn't Crushed have said it, it, couldn't have said it better myself. There's a good one in there. that talks about supplements and mm -hmm. allergies. Yep. And so Madara Cremel. Any supplements you feed your GSPs? Do your dogs have any allergies? I just found out my GSP has a chicken allergy. So uh, we don't utilize any uh, nutritional supplements other than every once in a while a probiotic in to help with some stress, especially we, with... We use a couple different things on occasion, but not consistently. Consistently. Yeah. Um, and then from an allergy standpoint, uh, I think that food allergies get thrown around a little bit. And I don't think that they're necessarily the reason. Um, I'm not a vet, and I haven't seen your specific dog, yeah, so I can't say we know they exist. It's not, we're not that. We're not saying that they don't, but they're very much less common than environmental allergies that get pinned on food. So, yeah. again, we don't know your case, but um, I would ask the question of when did it pop up, and what is it? Is it overall itching? red, itchy skin, things like that. And if it just happened recently, it sounds drastically more like it could be a seasonal, seasonal allergy, allergy type of thing. So 
just look at that before you go full ham on switching your dog's diet dog just based on yeah. the fact that not very many dogs actually have food allergies. Um, um and it, the ones that do, I mean, this was the research that I looked into. Is we did have um, a someone reach out with some allergy issues, some friends, and we were helping them with their dog. And it's one of those things that um, Apoquil shots really helped them. And it wasn't actually food related. We had another dog that was dropped off that had here at the kennel that had food that was said to have food allergy issues and. They were on a special GI diet, essentially full time because of this. And um, it ba- they, when they came in for training, it was like, we can't maintain, we can't maintain your dog's weight and work them on this specific food. Can we revisit regular dog food again? And they said, um, sure, let's go ahead and try it. Doug's 100% fine, been on regular food ever since. So, I, you know, in that situation, their stomach is upset. And I'm not saying it's yours. It, there are such a thing as food allergies. But I think that it's um, it's fewer and far between than what people think. That's my experience. I haven't found one with food allergies yet. So, so this is a question from Aaron Mumblu. Uh-huh. How are the videos coming on the topic of hunting that you showed us a sneak peek a few weeks ago? That was that like Onyx trailer. So, oh yeah, there. So we, th- the planning is going the great. The planning is going great. Not hunting season yet, so we can't be out there shooting the videos. But we are making the plans, planning the trips, getting the contacts in the areas, things like that. So. It is coming along. It is going to roll, but it's not able to actually shoot the videos until hunting season rolls around. So in the planning and production stage, is that what that's called? I'm not a video person. Uh, Yeah, we're talking about it. Storyboard. Storyboarding. We're storyboarding. That's a good word. I like it. Zing. Uh, We're we're talking about it. So this is We haven't actually drawn anything on any boards. (laughs) We got ideas. It's all up here. Jean Morris said, what is the best training to utilize kids with? Recall, place, et cetera, middle school age and below. So this is a great question. Um, And it is age dependent. So definitely middle school age and below. I don't know how much below of that. So what Cade, our two-year-old can help with versus what Aiden, our four and a half year old can help with are very different. Um, Cade really likes handing the dogs handfuls of food. So basically I ask for a behavior. I mark that behavior with our clicker and then I allow Cade to hand off the food reward. That's basically where he's at. With Aiden, he actually is able to ask for the behavior. I still am marking when the behavior happens. I feel like timing is the most important part of dog training. And second to consistency. Vice strike that reverse I know. (laughs) And so he can't necessarily get the timing perfect of marking the behavior. So he can do the reward. He can do the verbal cue. um, He can help gesture, move the dog, things like that. But he is not quite ready to do the marking yet at four and a half. As they get older, absolutely, they can be involved with the whole process of marking, rewarding, asking, um, the behavior. So this is actually kind of a little funny story. So all the dogs were out, um, on dog beds, were eating dinner and the dogs, or excuse me, the kids strike, I mean, kind of interchangeable, but the kids were making a mess while they eat dinner. It's, I am shocked at the amount of sticky that gets everywhere when they eat. The dogs are so much neater I'm when they eat. I'm kind of numb to it. I know. It's like, it's like this is every why, day. This is why we can't have meal, nice things. Every snack, you have to wipe down the kids, the entire the counters, kitchen. the chairs, the floor, all of it. Anyway, so they're the eating walls. Yeah, they're eating dinner. There's some food falling on the floor, Everything. and our youngest puppy Glitch is struggling with staying on his I dog you bed. Were our youngest puppy, Cade. That too. Um, is struggling to stay on his dog bed 
through this high level of food reward distractions that are falling manna from heaven, he wants to try and eat the snacks. So I am yeah. utilizing an e-collar for place training because he's collar conditioned to stay on his dog bed. He's collar conditioned to go to his dog bed when he feels vibration or stimulation on the collar. And But the transmitters were just out of reach. They were... Um, honestly closest to Aiden. And I said, hey, Aiden, can you hand me the transmitter with the pink tape on it? Because we have two sets of transmitters, That's six right. sets of call <laughs> or six total callers. So it's a lot of like buttons and things. Do you need me to shock a dog? <laughs> he goes, can I shock the dog? Or do you need me to shock a dog for you? And I was like, actually, no, just hand it to me so I can shock the dog. <laughs> Thanks though, buddy. Um, and not necessarily shock the dog, literally vibrate. But um, if he had needed stimulation, I would. But it's so interesting Aiden's perception of things how he understands that we use the e-cars to communicate with the dogs and he's like you need me to do this for you because I'd be happy to he's also always willing and ready to uh, correct his brother and tattletale on his brother and micromanage his brother and all the things so he is um, definitely moving into a head trainer position soon born leader yes Born bossy, that's for sure. Uh -huh. I think that's first child syndrome. So, What steps do you take when introducing a dog to the bird launcher for the first time? I think this is um, a good one. We have several videos on, and what I would recommend, the one that we did most recently... You're switching. I want to try the new one. Mm. Uh, the most recent one is with Hex, Hex, and he looks like a rock star. But watching it, so the big things are dog's collar condition is helpful. And then w the way that we like to set it up would be, let's draw this out. I need a new piece of paper. Five months ago? Is it that long? Oh, my goodness. Uh, that was bird introduction, I guess. No, there's another one. If you go to his playlist, you should see his videos in the playlist. Let's see my little drawing skills here. So that tail at 12 o'clock. So I think one thing that I just want to mention, when Floppy you're ears. utilizing bird launchers dogs for training ass. pointing breed dogs, is okay. that you need to make sure that you know where your launchers are and that your timing is good. You want to make sure that your dog is acknowledging scent. You're recognizing that acknowledgement of scent and you're getting that bird out of there. You're not letting your puppy work in, work in, getting right on top of that launcher and then launching the bird because that's when bad stuff can happen. You don't want to launch one of these bird launchers in a puppy's face. It startles them. It could hurt them. All of the things. If used properly, bird launchers are an amazing tool from um, getting puppies to point their first birds within the first session to working through steadiness drills with dogs that are prepping for advanced steadiness through AKC Master Hunters or the Nava Utility Testing. We utilize launchers for all of that. And um, so you need to make sure that your timing is right and you're not launching that with your puppy right on, on top of it. Ethan's going to set up some very good diagrams. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. It's good, okay? It's good. Don't quit your day job. I won't even think about it. So, uh, you see me it. in the bottom. Look at that. I've got my, my gun. I didn't have a pink pen, but that's definitely a pink gun, okay? So, um, I'm out there with my dog. Whoop. Which, if this is the first time your dog's on pigeons and launchers, you wouldn't have a gun with you. Just saying. I carry it everywhere. It is my It is my piece. Okay, um, there's my dog tail up because happy dogs are the best. This is the approach. You see how we're running uh, perpendicular to the bird who is up there, somehow intermixed with the wind, uh, which is important. Now, the reason you are welcome. I'm just going to say you are welcome for that drawing, um, even though I know nobody was thankful that I did it. The key being that that perpendicular approach to the wind situation, what that's going to do is make it very easy to see when the dog actually smells the bird, and that's when we need to launch it. Key with the bird launches are they can create really good dogs uh, or they can create really bad habits. Now, 
I'm going to pick Faithful Point Kennels. I saw a video that you posted on your Instagram the other day, and you show a dog coming in, and it kind of works in and gets birdie, and then points like this. And then the bird pops immediately up from right there in front of it. This is part of what can create, now that may not be the only time that happened, it was just circumstance, which is part of things, but if that's normally how close that dog is pointing to the bird launchers, we need to change some things because that's not going to get us to the end goal, which would be pointing a wild or a real bird. So we've got to keep some distance and we have to make our bird launcher essentially be the wildest wild bird that you have ever seen. And that teaches dogs respect of the birds one, and it teaches them to be cautious and that they overdid it a little bit or they got too close or they need to be sneakier next time, which is what ultimately brings out the pointing instinct. And then you have dogs that are stopping at good distances and being respectful. With as birds. soon as their scent acknowledgement is typically when you want to launch that so that you can create that distance. Correct. And then what we do from there is allow them to learn essentially, right? That um, this bird is over, over pressured and then this bird is not over pressured and this bird ex- is still there. This bird is not there. So dogs, as they mature through the stages, will learn all of these things, which is why we benefit from bird launchers to begin with because we know exactly where the birds are. We can help the dogs to be successful and build off of good reps and consistency. So it's a good question. Thanks for the super chat, Aaron. Sorry for picking. Cheers as well to you. Um, Nan Taylor said, which of your dogs do your boys like best? Mm. So I would honestly say Aiden probably likes Questy Pup best. He, that's who he was asking for to sleep with. Um, but she is not finished with her master hunter testing and then she's going to roll into utility testing. So it's going to be a minute before she's ready for, uh, sleeping in Aiden's bed. No, she's ready. It's just going to be a minute before she can. There you go. So she, yeah, she's she ready would, to sleep. She's in Aiden's ready. Bed. Yeah, yeah, she would sleep in bed all day long if you let her. And that's what I think Aiden really appreciates about her is just like she's super calm, super chill, happy to sleep and snuggle. Allie is also super calm, super chill. So she is a very good um, alternative to Questy Pup. Um, and I would say Cade really likes Allie right now because he can say her name. <laughs> And it's so adorable how he says it. So other than that, I don't really know if they have other favorites. They definitely know the dog's names. Um, Aiden does for sure. And Cade, Cade knows Allie's name. When we are oh, hollering for... Just said. Did you say Cade? I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah. It's all right. She's the best. So yeah, he, I said Cade probably thinks Allie's his favorite because that's the one dog's name he can say. Yes, and he does. Allie was literally standing inside behind him, and we were trying to get... We were hollering at Doc, or you were hollering at Doc, who would run down to the pond or something, right? And he's like, Allie, Allie. I'm like, Cade. He looks at me. Like, Allie's right behind you. Allie, Allie. It's so funny because we were trying to call her out of the bedroom earlier to come out to lay on a dog bed. And this is how our boys whistle. They go, (laughs) trying to make the sound that Ethan makes when he whistles. And then he's makes that sound, and then he's, like, patting his legs. Allie, Allie, like, that's what we do when we're trying to get little puppies to come to us. We whistle, and we're like, puppy, 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 and he's doing the exact same thing. So they totally watch and learn, mimic, monkey see, monkey do, and that's how we involve them with being active parts of working with the dogs, training the dogs, that sort of thing. So There you go. Um, it says itchy paws since October. So probably less environmental. I see what you're saying with Mm -hmm. that. But sometimes you can just end up with skin issues that are hard to overcome. And it could it could potentially I'm sure you're working with a vet. I I hope that you're working with a vet. But um, I have seen firsthand these things where random itchy places show up and it literally Mm -hmm. is a, a skin infection. So All things to look at. Um, Ultimately, changing food is also a pretty easy thing to try. What was the original question with that? I don't know if there was one. It was just that they had allergies. And what do we supplement If we were doing any supplements, because they they were allergic to chicken. Yep. 
No. I mean, we've been really happy with a, an extremely large variety of dogs eating Yukonuba dog food. And though I'm, I'm not trying to say it's the right dog food for every single dog in the whole world, it does work really well for a big majority of them. We had a dog in the kennel recently even that started some random itchy type stuff. And that, thank you, ma'am. And that ended up being um, exactly the set of skin infection. We had that quite a few years ago. It was something that just popped up and it was basically they were itchy everywhere. And that was fixed because, again, it was a skin infection. Not allergies. Not allergies, though it presented as allergies. And they did do, uh, I think both dogs got Apoquil shots, which just really cut down on the itchiness and... I've seen it myself. I had uh, an itchy type of episode, and it's one of those things that sometimes you just have to get the itchy to stop so that... It can heal. It can... Because it's no longer something that's affecting it. It's just the itching itself kind of spreads to more itching, and the skin can't, you know, the skin can't stop itching. So that might be something to consider. Sorry, I don't have a whole lot more in the way of answers on that one, but... Okay, I have a question that I want to answer. Moving on. Moving on. Brandon Henniker said, our five-month-old GSP is very mouthy. Is there any more tips you can give to help us stop that? We just started introducing her to the e-collar. Can that be used to help stop that behavior? So my question is, mouthy, does that mean they're literally, like, barking at you during training sessions, things like that? Or are they, like, munching, mouthing birds? My assumption is they're, like, mouthy, barking at you, assassin, things like that in training sessions. And if that is the case, I highly recommend you go and watch some of the YouTube live videos that we did uh, when we were training Legacy. Because Instagram she, live? Did I say that? Yeah, yeah, Instagram live, sorry. Instagram live videos that I was doing when we were training Legacy. She was super sassy and mouthy with me as well during training sessions. And I showed live during those training sessions how we were working through that. And... Um, so check those out. I'm not giving you any more information. I want you to follow our YouTube channel or our Instagram channel. So besides we're like sitting at 103,000 followers on Instagram and it is bugging the heck out of me that we can't. We had 104 today. What? No, we didn't. Made you look. Okay. So we've been trying, like, I've been like, yeah, we're, we're so close to 104. It's going to happen. And it doesn't. So if you guys don't follow us on Instagram and your subscribers on YouTube, please go follow us on Instagram because it would make me so happy if I woke up tomorrow morning and we were at 104,000 subscribers because we have been trying to hit that since like February. It just keeps sitting there at like 103,997. 91 right now. We're nine down. short. Yeah. We were at 103,999. I screenshot it, sent it to Ethan, and we were like, we're one away. And then it was like, done. Then I unfollowed. You dirty dog. And then it just trickle affected a whole bunch of other people unfollowing, apparently. so It's doing that right now with... Stop. Uh, it's because it's in wide focus and IAF is off. Uh, it's all set up for Destiny videos and not for Ethany live streams. Uh, Got it. Come on, Dustin. <laughs> um. Okay, we got time for like n- negative one more, so we're gonna do one more because I'm in charge. Okay. Hey, GDIY made it. Yay! Undarted finally made show. it. Yes, sassy during training, but also just goes for hands out of nowhere. Oh, both. Good. So there, we also have a video on YouTube about impulse control, and that would be one that I would highly recommend. Basically, it's your choice, and you should choose to take this treat nicely. Um, impulse control is huge, especially for short hairs. Uh, they are they struggle with impulse control from threshold manners to taking treats nicely to just being patient and waiting. So building on impulse control, working on their patients is really important. Uh, Miss Kelly, you're hundred percent right. Dustin is the best. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And 173,000 YouTube subscribers, or if you don't 
I would imagine if you're here, you probably already subscribe. But if you don't, you should. Okay. Chesapeake Bay Retriever crossed with a German short hair po- pointer. That sounds like a horrible idea. <laughs> we could make curly coated pointers. Yeah. Never Do use Labradors and Golden Retrievers to breed with a hunting dog. That's the mistake. I think that we're just going to keep breeding short hairs to short hairs and go with that. Original. Not. How bold of you. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we... Um, oh, no, no, no. Go down. Go down. I it's tick one. season. What's your best recommendation for that? Tick prevention. We use Brevecto. Yeah, Brevecto's been pretty pretty good stuff. Go down. I saw one, and you were just like scrolling so fast. Couldn't read it. Thanks for the art, Ethan. That's all I wanted to read. <laughs> that wasn't a question. Okay, guys, that is all that we have time for tonight. We have a babysitter that's watching the boyos, so we have to get back to that and make sure that bedtime is facilitated properly. So until next time, I'm Cat the Dog Trainer. I'm the guy with the pink gun. We'll see you in the next video, which will not be next week because that is Cater Potato's birthday. So we're going to be spending time Happy with him. Happy birthday to you. The 